afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Volition of RX corporate presentation. Thank you to Bobby and Shelley Kraft for having Volition back again at the Tenant Microcap Showcase for having me back presenting for the first time in person in several years. Um, we are Volition RX Limited, ticker BM RX on the NYSC American Stock Exchange. Important to our obligatory forward looking statements and disclaimer slide, which reminded that I'm making some statements today that are of a forward looking nature that may or may not materialize in the future. A little bit about Volition. We are a, a diagnostics company. We're working primarily in blood, developing blood tests to screen for various disease states, primarily in oncology, but we are looking at our first non oncology based disease states. The company has five verticals. I'll begin with the acronym NUQ, which stands for Nucleosome Modification. And um, on the top left, NUQ there on its own is our uh, human health uh, vertical in oncology. So we are clinical stage in colorectal cancer, lung cancer, and lung cancers. cancers. Uh, NUQ bed in the center there, that is commercial stage. We launched a blood test to screen for two common canine cancers a couple of years ago with Texas a and University, and then we recently, about one month ago, um, signed a, a very significant licensing deal uh, for volition with uh, the Hesco Corporation. Our licensing deal for Hesco to license our blood test for canines. Um, the top on the center right there, you can capture. That's essentially our uh, research and development division. Our patents are housed there. A lot of our uh, technological breakthroughs have occurred there. A lot of our um, product development and thinking about what products are are needed, um, what types of biomarkers we're looking for, and so forth. And that's what you capture. And if you nets on the bottom left, that's our first movement into developing blood tests to screen for uh, non oncology based disease states, looking at COVID 19 and sepsis patients there. And if you nets. And if you discover, um, that is uh, largely our second facility in Europe, a uh, 10,000 square foot manufacturing facility that we purchased a couple years ago. Our uh, purpose is really to provide third party um, contract manufacturing, sample processing, antibody supply to other uh, primarily European based uh, diagnostics and pharmaceutical companies. And um, we're starting to write about the new discover program. As we Sign some smaller contracts with some third parties in Europe and expect to continue uh, the revenue growth in discover. Most of you are probably interested in UQ Pets since that's our first commercial product. And uh, comes this presentation comes on the heels of a very significant licensing deal with the Hester Corporation. So I'm just going to skip ahead here. The brand name is the UQ Vet Cancer Screening Test. And uh, this is developed through our wholly owned subsidiary, Volition Veterinary Diagnostics Development, LLC. And as you can see from this slide, you can see some of the performance. So we, we ran several studies at Texas a and University at their Veterinary College of Medicine. Uh, around 330 canines were studied, and you can see the results we achieved in the uh, in Canine lymphoma and hemangiomas sarcoma. So um, we identified 77 percent of canines of lymphoma and 82 percent of hemangiomas sarcoma. Um, so about eight out of ten canines, roughly, we are um, correctly identifying with these two cancer types. These two cancer types are very common cancers in canine. The canines they account for about one third of all canine cancers. So we're screening for a substantial portion of canine cancers currently. Um, we're also Further in clinical studies at Texas a and University to see if we can have a third or fourth, fifth, or sixth canine cancer. So ideally, we can be screening for the majority of canine cancers over time. Um, the 97 percent specificity that's your that's your false positive rate. So you subtract that from 100, it gives you a 3 percent false positive rate, which is this, this, which is negative. So almost no false positives um, in, in that study. So it's a test that's highly accurate. It's very low false positives, and, uh, and it's highly sensitive. About about eight percent of canines are being identified with um, cancer that actually have cancer. Uh, at least these two types of cancer. Um, we um, we 
you asked of the licensing deal recently, but I'd like to kind of just take a step back and talk about the screening ecosystem for um, screening for canine, cancer in canines. So we used to have a slide in the deck, um, but there are about 77 million canines in the United States alone. Six million of those are diagnosed with cancer every single year. So just under 10% of canines are diagnosed with cancer. And that's obviously a, a gross undercounting of the actual number of canines that get cancer each year, because many canines will get sick, will pass away, and there's no confirmed cause of death. And of course, you don't perform the blood from the same number of canines to find out quite past, just, just passed away. But a number of those um, undiagnosed are obviously being caused by underlying cancer types. Um, the problem, though, is that currently, the six million canines diagnosed with cancer annually, the problem is the vast majority of those six million are diagnosed. Why? Because they're sick. They're symptomatic, right? And that's a problem because once your canine is sick, when you take it to the vet, it's probably 10 or 12 to 13 years old. It's sick, and the, currently the, uh, the confirmatory tests to confirm the presence of cancer are either imaging technologies or biopsies. So x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, or biopsies. Those are expensive and invasive tests to run. They can actually run the canine. The canine typically has to be given anesthesia because the canine doesn't know that it's going for an x-ray or biopsy. It doesn't know to sit still. So those are the only ways to confirm uh, the presence of cancer. So what happens currently is all these six million canines, most of them are getting sick first, going in, the vets trying not to do x-rays and CAT scans, and trying not to do biopsies because they're very expensive and invasive, and the canine owner doesn't really want to spend that kind of money on the first sick visit, for instance. Meanwhile, if the symptoms are being caused by an underlying cancer, it's probably already in stage. Right? If you're symptomatic, it's probably a stage two or stage four, and you don't have a lot of good options then. So if you finally have the vet run the imaging technologies for biopsies, it comes back as cancer is probably stage four. You really have two options. You can euthanize your canine, which is a horrible option, or you can spend hundreds, thousands, in many cases tens of thousands of dollars on treatment to treat your canine with late stage cancer and maybe extend its life for a few months or maybe a year. It's either option is particularly palpable. Um, and so the reason that this is occurring is because until our blood test was launched, there existed no convenient, inexpensive, uh, fast way to screen for cancers uh, asymptomatically in canines. So canines do not get screened asymptomatically for cancer because the only options until our blood test were imaging technologies or biopsies. And you're not going to take your five-year-old German shepherd that's healthy into the vet and have the vet run all these invasive tests on it and spend thousands of dollars to find out if your five-year-old German Shepherd has cancer. Probably doesn't. But now we have the option to to um, have this procedure implemented for the first time in animal health. We have uh, what's going to be priced at fifty dollars to the canine owner, a blood test that's highly accurate for these two cancer types that can now be used for asymptomatic screening because it's inexpensive, it's convenient, and it's accurate. And this is what attracted the attention of PESCO. I mean, in fact, it's attracted the attention of, of many companies like PESCO, and even companies much larger than PESCO that are quite interested in what we're doing, uh, because there's nothing else out there. There's simply nothing else out there. Now, for the first time, you can take your seven or eight-year-old canine in for a wellness check to the vet, and if it's already undergoing all these other blood tests, this can just be added on as another blood test. Um, PESCO has both point of care and reference labs. So if, it's, if the test is being done as you know, eight or ten other blood tests that are being run, the sample can just be sent to ask for reference time for analysis of all those type of blood tests that are being run. If it's not, it can be done through PESCO's point of care technology. So they can just do the, the test right there at the veterinary clinic. And within an hour, the results will come out. So if you want it, you know, they can run the test first and do other. Uh, on this, you know, other parts of the wellness check, or you could just sit uh, waiting for an hour, read a magazine, and the results will come back. Um, I don't know if it's positive or answer. So, this is um, a very disruptive and very important uh, technology and a product that we're pushing forward to the marketplace. It generated a lot of attention from PESCO. 
for the institutional contingent of the deal here. So we gave HESCA exclusive rights worldwide for canines and for all companion animals going forward, so that includes felines and other companion animals. Uh, they have a non-exclusive for a uh, reference lab, and um, this included, uh, this was a $28 million licensing deal, $10 million up front, which we've already received, and we're looking about this revenue for Q1. And uh, the other $18 million comes, I don't know how much of the $18 we've disclosed, I believe we disclosed that 6.5 of the $18 comes when ESCO launches point of care, another 6.5 million when ESCO launches the reference labs, and the other 5 million. We have not disclosed what that trigger is. Um, but the first two, the six and a half, the six and a half, so the 13 million uh, after the, the initial 10 is highly likely to come probably Q4, Q1 uh, once that's the launches. So, really excited about this. Um, our analysts are having a really hard time modeling out revenue from this. But in addition to the 28 million, and that's all on the loop of capital, uh, PEST is not being issued any equity for this. It's simply upfront payments. Um, basically for future revenue streams. In addition to the 28 million, we have disclosed publicly that we get $10 from HESCA for every reference lab sale that they make. So they, they're selling it to the vets for 25, the vets are selling it to k owners for about 50, and we're getting 10 of the 25 um, from HESCA. So we're getting a significant chunk of that in addition to the 28 million. We've not disclosed how much we get per test to the point of care, but it's less than $10. And um, we've stated publicly that we expect us to be selling millions and millions of these tests sort of once on the rental capacity. It's going to take them a period of time to educate their salespersons to um, get the supply of antibodies from us to you know, label and package into the point of care technology. So we're expecting that, that sort of education and um, us to supply the antibodies um, to ramp kind of over the course of 2022. Expect to see sales start to ramp in 2023. But you can do the math. If we're getting 10 for reference lab sales and less than 10 for point of care, and that's to sell millions of tests, let's say we're getting 11, you know, $7 per test, and selling 3 million tests per year or 5 million tests per year, you can do the math. It's only very plain. We're not going to do four Our cost of goods is under a dollar. So we have a very uh, packed profit margin. So I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, what uh, I don't think I mentioned is that in addition to um, asymptomatic screening, we think this test has a second, um, second usage or second use case, that, that for monitoring. So after canines have been diagnosed with cancer, um, we think our blood test has it as well. We think our blood test can be administered serially to measure the amount of um, tumor-derived debris in the canine's blood sample. The thought being, if the canine has cancer and is undergoing treatment for cancer, the thought is that if the tumor is shrinking, there should be less tumor-derived debris in the canine's blood sample. That means the treatment is probably effective. So if we're seeing a quantitative decline over a several month period, the treatment's probably working. If we're not seeing any decline, the treatment's probably not working. That canine probably wants to switch to a different form of therapy or treatment. Um, so that would be a small market that would just be canines that are still alive, diagnosed with cancer, but this would be a serial test that could be run weekly, monthly, quarterly, several times over the course of that cancer treatment. So we would have a, a more frequency of tests for a smaller market, and that really isn't included the, the, sort of the, the millions of tests per year, so that could be a significant uh, addition. In addition, we think that there's um, a use case for felines as well, so we're starting to run studies at Texas a to look at the application here and the efficacy of our blood test in the diagnosis of uh, cancer and in felines. So really excited about this opportunity. I probably spent uh, a little too much time on, on the animal health portion, so, uh, and uh, I'll just mention we did sign up our first license to do with SAGE uh, healthcare out of Singapore in December, and that's a smaller license to do but uh, nonetheless, that gives us a, a foothold in uh, Singapore and other parts of Asia. Best is primarily U.S., um, but uh, they do have some international reach. And I'll talk, I think I've got about 10 minutes, but I'll talk about the next because I, I believe this is um, another area, one of our other pillars will have additional clinical data over the course of this year into next year. Uh, next is, is, a, is an acronym as well. It's, it's short for uh, mitosis or neutrophil extracellular <coughs> traps. And 
what um, what this is all about is that when you become infected with a virus or a pathogen, one of the body's first immune responses is for your white blood cells to inject neutrophil extracellular traps or nets, as they are. you can see on the right hand side. Um, that's chromatin material that your white blood cells inject into your bloodstream, and um, they uh, they are cytotoxic proteins. And the objective is for those cytotoxic proteins to try and kill, develop and kill the invading bacteria or virus uh, to stop it from affecting the body or to other parts of the body. For, re uh, for reasons unknown, in certain individuals, um, the, the, the body overproduces nets. And it, it's, it's the cytokine storm that they, many of you have heard about in uh, COVID-19. It's actually the cytokine storm that kills you from COVID-19 infection. It's also what kills you from sepsis infection. Sepsis is the leading cause of death in, in hospitals. And um, so these are, these are big markets for us, significant problems. What we are doing and not doing is we are not developing this blood test to, to, to be a diagnostic to tell a patient or a doctor whether a person has COVID-19 or sepsis, but this is a, a test to be used after confirmed infection from one of these two pathogens to try and triage and provide a risk stratification analysis on that patient to determine whether or not that patient is likely to develop the very severe symptoms of infection. Because right now, doctors, nor, neither doctors nor patients have any way to predict which person is infected with COVID-19 or sepsis will have mild, moderate, or severe symptoms. Short of a person being really, really sick, you know, upon diagnosis, there's no way to know. And many people um, are infected with COVID-19, and if you're asymptomatic, what happens? The, the, you're sent home to isolate your bedroom, right? And if, if you get a really severe reaction in three or four or five days later, you may want to go back to the hospital, you may want to check in with the doctor, you may want to get additional um, drugs or therapies to, to help you with the infection. But that's not a very efficient way of monitoring disease severity, right? Because what happens is a lot of people, men probably in particular, you know, if, they, if we go home and we get sick a few days later, we're not typically rushing back to the hospital, right? So, oh, I'm going to wait it out, this and that, and see if I get better over the course of a day or two. What happens is if you're not seeking medical treatment right away, it can be damaged onto your organs, right? Because you're not seeking medical treatment that you need. So what we've developed, um, and I'll say what we've developed and what we haven't developed. What we have developed is a way to measure the amount of nets in a person's blood sends out. Very, very, very high accuracy. In addition to being able to measure the amount of nets in a person's bloodstream, we know that there's a very strong correlation between quantity of nets and disease severity. So those people who are asymptomatic with sepsis or COVID-19 have about 20 nanograms per microliter of nets degree in their bloodstream. Those patients with very severe symptoms, in fact, two, two patients who died from COVID-19, um, in the study, they had 20,000 nanograms per micro, microliter of mitosis degree in their bloodstream. Very strong correlation. The big question that is not answered is how, how far in advance of the onset of disease severity does the body overinject nets? So the way that this will be used ideally is you're confirmed with sepsis infection or COVID-19, you would immediately take a patient blood test. If your NETS level is low, you're okay. But, all, but we would ideally test every single day to monitor. So all of a sudden, you go from 20 nanograms per microliter to 10,000, and, and you're, you're still demonstrably asymptomatic. We know that you're probably going to get really sick. You are going to get really sick really soon. The question is, what is that lag time? So does the body over-inject, and then within minutes or hours, you're really sick? Or is it 12 hours, 36 hours, 72 hours? If there's that window of opportunity and you're testing regularly, there's a chance to triage that patient, get them the medical resources that are needed, or going to be needed very, very soon, so that when that severe reaction comes in, you either you maybe have a ventilator or you're able to have a ventilator and then you have a hospital bed, um, you may give them antibiotics, whatever the proper treatment protocol might be. So it's a much more efficient allocation of medical resources being directed to those patients that are going to need it really, really desperately, and it's you know an allocation and, and documented medical resources to those people that don't need it because their mental health is very, very low. That's what we're doing right now. We're, we're running longitudinal studies in the UK to see what kind of lag time there is, um, and if there is enough of a lag time, we have a very again very disruptive and very important product here. This for the first time, uh, doctors will be able to predict 
with very high accuracy, which patients can never listen. And this will obviously save lives, uh, reduce long term morbidity and long term organ damage. Uh, so, really excited about this product. I think I'm down to just a few minutes, so I don't really have time to cover a lot of the other areas. Uh, I did cover, discover a little bit about the third party um, separate processing and antibody supplier production. I covered a little bit about who can capture our R&D. Don't really have time to talk about the oncology, but we are clinical stage in colorectal lung cancer and uh, two bloodborne cancers. Um, maybe I'll just talk about the potential. So, and then I'm happy to answer any questions about the oncology programs if anyone wants. I think we've done 20 minutes. So I'll, I'll just go through colorectal cancer for the that um, I'll do one of our, our human health programs. Colorectal cancer is an interesting cancer type. Um, the current screen for it in the US is the colonoscopy. That's highly accurate. So then you might see a wise solution developing blood tests for colorectal cancer if the colonoscopy is highly accurate. It's highly accurate, but not if people use it. Compliance is a big problem. People don't like colonoscopies. The other option is the fecal test. The people don't like the test either. So the problem is one of compliance. Not enough people get screened for colorectal cancer. It's an asymptomatic cancer from the stage. So what happens is people turning age 45 are supposed to go to their first colonoscopy. They don't. They're 50, they're 55, 60, 65. Suddenly they're symptomatic. They finally go for that colonoscopy for the first time. If it's confirmed colorectal cancer in stage four, and most of them are dead in five years. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be the case if there were a, a more preferred modality to screen for colorectal cancer. I need a blood test like ours because while a person may delay that first colonoscopy five, 10, 15, 20 years and never do it, that same person probably would not reduce the blood test if they were accurate and expensive and unavailable, this just added to their blood work by going into the animal physical. So, huge opportunity for colorectal. There are over 100 million Americans of screening age, 150 million Europeans of screening age. Compliance in the US is 62%. Compliance is in Europe is 50 So, half of Europeans are not going to screen for colorectal cancer. One of the main reasons that colorectal cancer has become the second leading cause of cancer related death in this country. So, big opportunity there inside in oncology. You can see our Q4 financials. Um, again, our ticker BNRX and NYC American market caps closer to 150, 160. The market's been obviously tough this year on, on most healthcare stocks. You can see our 52 week range. We're close to our 52 week low, pretty much a million per month of cash on hand, 20 million. That excludes the 10 million from Tesla. And that uh, obviously doesn't include the burn that we've uh, you know, experienced January from in March, April. So you can kind of do the math and figure out how much cash on here. We have quite a year's worth of cash, but remember we have the additional 13 million we have in Pesca and we have the uh, coming in from Pesca on sales next year. So let me start up there too. There. Uh, five analysts part of the company, Kevin Fitzgerald, Maxim, Benchmark, Sachs, and Aegis. Uh, strong insider ownership, and you can more than about 17.5%. Institution of about 35%. Western retail, that's the family. Website, that's volition.com. Sorry for speaking fast at the end. I just wanted to cover as much as I could. Any questions? Sorry, I'm probably going to be a bit tough. <laughs> so, I think I think they're going to change it. Uh, they just started advertising on the front page of their website, so I think they have branded us as their own. And also, uh, as far as the tax of the product does, are you doing cost plus like the tax of the product? Or are they buying it at wholesale? So, for, um, for the point of care, we're providing the antibodies. Um, so, I think we're selling, selling the antibodies for $10. For the point of care, um, they're doing a lot of the manufacturing. This is a special kit. So we're getting less than that. Our cost of goods is less. Um, so we haven't disclosed what that is, but it's under 10. So, uh, that's, what's the path to the Um, Probably a CD market in Europe. Uh, we're trying to move through the work with the research we've done so far has been in Germany, Belgium, and the UK. So it makes sense. Maybe, maybe it's similar to like an EUA uh, type authorization in Europe or, or, uh, or similar to a 510 camp pathway, but we'll likely go for the same market uh, later this year or the next year. Um, we'll try to get the cells to the various companies and hospitals. What's the average test? Right now it's um, 
for animal health and for nets for simply quantifying the amount of the basal degree. So it's the So our H3.1 parasitic is simply measuring the total basal degree. Um, for colorectal cancer, we have specific biomarker mutations that we look at, but for um, animal health and uh, nets, it's just the quantity of the basal degree. <laughs> okay. She's the boss. One, one minute. Answer. <laughs> oh, I didn't mention that. Um, we're getting sensitivity in the 78 to 82 percent range, and specificity in the 80 to 90 percent range. So about 10 to 20 percent false negatives, 10 to 20 percent false positives. Depends on the study the size, the antibodies. We also switch from serum to plasma, so um, we haven't had clinical results. In some time in colorectal. So we should have some work and we have some more time on studies. I think if we're in the 80s on sensitivity specificity, we're, we're in good shape, both from an FDA perspective and also from reimbursement. Um, the polar bar is um, at a 287 sensitivity specificity. Um, uh, I think the is uh, 68, 78 is pretty low in terms of sensitivity specificity. Uh, they have a lot of challenges to the reverse, but even just getting into your pool. So I think we need to be in the case of the pool. Thank you, everyone.